regular, our regular evening is Monday evening, but because three of our counselors were at a League, Women, League of Cities meeting, um, we moved the meeting to Wednesday. So this is our regular uh, March meeting. May I have the roll call, please? Chairman Carson? Here. Councilor Berry? Here. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Roberts? Present. Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. Councilor Watson? Here. Manager McGovern? Here. And Town Clerk? Present. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Reports and correspondence. Oh. <laughs> Councilor Swift Kayata. Whoever. Um, as uh, was noted just a minute ago uh, by yourself, we three of us, uh, Carolyn Fritz, John McGinty, and I, um, as long as, as, as well as the municipal clerk, Deborah Lane, were at the National League of Cities Congressional City Conference. Um, we, I think, had an uh, some good meetings there and inform we heard some informative speakers and we also had meetings with our congressional delegation which was informative for us and also presented to them our views on a number of issues so I think it was a good meeting and I want to especially thank the town clerk Deborah Lane for her help um, in shepherding us around and making sure we got where we were going especially on the metro system <laughs> <laughs> thank you Councilor McGinty? Can I just follow up on that? Um, one of the issues that we discussed with our congressional um, delegation was the issue of special education funding. And it's a big issue across the state for all school districts. Um, it has a, a negative impact on property taxes because the federal government is not funding special education. Uh, their appropriation should be 40 percent. They're funding it at about 12 percent. Thank you. Um, so all of the uh, representatives from across the state, including um, our own here from the town, uh, emphasize that we feel that um, they should um, follow their mandate and fund that at 40 percent, which will, of course, relieve our, the burden on our property tax because we have to make up that difference from our own personal property tax here in town. And so that was one of the biggest items, I think, that probably yeah. has a direct impact on the town of Cape Elizabeth. It was pointed out by uh, numerous members of the, uh, the people from various main municipalities that were uh, in these meetings that um, this would be an excellent form of tax relief. And in this time when we're talking about tax relief all the time, it would be great if the federal government could live up to its commitment that it set up when it started these special education programs and fully fund it at 40 cents on the dollar. And that would directly fall down to the bottom line of the town, which would in effect also have the uh, a positive effect, a lowering effect on the property tax. So it would be tax relief. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I'd just, just like to mention that it, it was a privilege to be able to go uh, on behalf of the, the town. And um, echoing what the other counselors said about it, I mean, I think the main purpose was to learn a lot about what's going on at the federal level that affects municipalities because a lot of what they do is pass legislation and it mandates us to do something at the local level and, uh, and that ends up meaning property tax increases. But, um, and then also visiting our delegations. Um, but I also attended a couple of workshops that I thought were um, of interest. Uh, one was on environment and growth and they talked a lot about smart growth. Um, and it was good to hear that the EPA was really saying that smart growth issues are really state and local issues and that there was an interest there in looking at federal legislation that may cause development with their incentives to move out rather than um, be more concentrated in communities. Um, and then the other one that I attended, because I'm currently serving on a long-range committee for uh, the schools, was one on education, where um, two um, 
while there was a presentation by the Bush administration staff, one by um, the House majority staff for the Education Committee, and uh, Senator Kennedy's staff, and then someone from Chicago. And that it was, I must say, a very energetic uh, <laughs> meeting and discussion because there was a lot of debate about the issues dealing with education and upcoming things. So it was very, very worthwhile, I think. That's good. Councillor Watson. Madam Chair, I'd just like to report on the March 1st meeting of the Maine Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Group. Um, we met and discussed uh, a variety of bills. I cannot believe the number of bills that the current legislature is dealing with, but a couple of, uh, to, uh, to note are uh, right now there are three bills before the legislature dealing with increasing homestead exemption from 7,000 uh, to, in one case, and in, in, in two cases, up to 10,000, increasing it, or in another case, to increase it from 7 to 15,000. And the Maine Municipality, uh, Maine Municipal Association's Legislative Policy Group believes that um, there may be a time in the future when increasing homestead exemption is a good idea, but with a budget shortfall of 260 million to 270 million, depending upon what we're looking at for reduction in, in sales tax revenues, um, this is not the year to be adjusting homestead exemptions. So I just wanted to report that the Legislative Policy Committee was unanimous in their support that all three of those bills ought not to pass. And it really isn't a commentary on the homestead exemption, per se, but is a commentary on the state shortfall. And at some point, I think that the legislature will look at that again, increasing it. And also just want to report on the um, general purpose aid to education. It appeared that the Appropriation Committee might look at um, adding more money to the pot, per se, and um, above the 2 percent increase that was going to be set aside for hardship cases. But with the most recent figures showing an additional 47 to 50 million shortfall in revenues, the Appropriation Committee has just tabled that decision. So where we might have thought Cape Elizabeth and other surrounding towns might see some relief, I think reality is that we're probably looking at that $400,000 shortfall in the state subsidy for education. I mean, that's the way it stood as of March 1st. We have another meeting coming up next week. Maybe the temperature of the water will be different, but um, I just wanted to report on those two local issues. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. On a more positive, upbeat note, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to compliment the uh, Engine 2 uh, Fire Company for their successful uh, fundraiser, this annual lobster stew dinner that they had on Saturday. They make uh, a fairly good amount of money, I believe, for the scholarships for that, but more importantly, it's a beautiful opportunity for people to get to meet the firefighters and the rescue people and the, I believe they have wet team people and the fire police. They have volunteers from all those different companies that operate out of that building that come, come in and spend the best part of Saturday to put it on and uh, serve the public. And again, they did an excellent job. Thank you. Town Clerk Lane. Thank you very much. I just wanted to remind the public that the nomination papers for council and school board are now available. Matter of fact, Monday is the deadline, Monday meaning March 19th, and we close at 5 p.m. at Town Hall. We have two seats available on the council, two seats available on the school board. These are three-year terms. Um, and just to mention, to date, um, there are three individuals that have expressed interest in the town council. So as of right now, it appears that there will be three names um, on that slate. And as of now, um, only one uh, person has actually taken out papers for school board. So if anyone is interested for either position, having your name on the ballot, you need between 25 and 100 registered voters nominating you for that. So please see me as soon as possible, because again, <laughs> Monday at 5 is the deadline. And the election is Tuesday, May 1st. Thank you. Madam Chair, I had one other item. I managed, luckily, to miss the last big snowstorm. But I have had several emails and communications and calls from citizens around the town and I really want to commend Bob Malley and everybody at Public Works for the great job they've been doing trying to keep up with all the snow we've had lately. Um, I've had a number of compliments that I feel I should pass along to them. They've been doing a great job. And um, 
let's hope they don't have to keep continuing <laughs> Duke. What's I've got quite the same such a thing in job. my end of town, and I want to add to my support of these comments, too. I think Bob Malley and the snow crew have done a wonderful job this, mm -hmm. this last month. Great. Are there any other reports and correspondence from councilors? Hearing none, town manager's report, please. Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chairman. I have a couple of items. I want to join the councilors in, in commending the members of the Department of Public Works for all of their efforts during the storm. And I know there was, a, there was an article in the newspaper uh, mentioning, I know uh, Councilor McGinty was quoted in it as a member of the rescue, of how much it's, it's the Public Works Department, but there's so many that pitch in, the firefighters who, who helped to clear the hydrants. Uh, it's really a, a total team effort. The custodians, the some of the school employees who've been cleaning off roofs. I noticed in New Hampshire there's been particularly a number of roofs that have collapsed, and uh, there's really a lot of people who have put efforts together. I was looking at the payroll uh, beginning of the week at last week's payroll, and the average public works employee, the mean of all of them, uh, worked 36 hours of overtime last week. Mm -hmm. There was even one part-time employee who just comes in for emergencies during storms who worked a total of 57 hours last week. Yeah. So it, it gives you a real sense of the commitment of these individuals. I, th I think that what I heard was that they were three nights without any sleep. Although we, we did during the, that real lengthy, lengthy storm, we uh, did send them home for about six hours on one of the evenings. And uh, it was really nice. Some other folks came in and plowed. Some of them had never plowed before. Oh. We, we wouldn't have told yeah. anyone that <laughs> night. But, you know, they just did, they did a terrific job. And, you know, particularly the importance of the safety of the other employees that they have a chance to go home. So I'd really like to thank all of the different personnel from all the departments who helped there, but obviously particularly the public works folks, the full-time workers, as well as the, the part-timers who, who came in to help. I've always wanted to drive a plow, you know. <laughs> I've sat on the wing, I've been on the wing, but I really wanted, so if you've had a lot of people plowing that have never plowed before, I want my chance. <laughs> we, we did call on people who never plowed, but we still do have standards, Madam Chair. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Is that the end of your report? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, on another issue, uh, I just wanted to update the council on a number of uh, issues involving the condition of our roads. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, the snow gets off them, but we're left with uh, frost heaves that, that are challenging at best. Uh, there's, there are three that I want to speak of. There's some other problems that are out there that we don't have, that we're not addressing yet, quite frankly. But there's three that, that we are looking at in this project's pending. Uh, one is Broad Cove Road, extended, excuse me, from Route 77 down to Salt Spray Lane. Uh, that particular section, we scheduled today uh, a neighborhood meeting that will occur on Wednesday, April 11th at 7.30 p.m. at the uh, Frank and Norma Gaziano Parish Hall at St. Bartholomew's Church. Uh, there will be a letter going out to everyone in Broad Cove informing them of that meeting, and the purpose of it is to discuss the scope of the project so everyone knows exactly that something is going to be done to the road and, uh, you know, get some sense of some of the issues that the citizens may have there. That then, you know, there's, there's some budget implications for it, obviously, but that will be a project that will be then coming back to the council with the final plans once they're developed after reaching out to the citizens in that neighborhood. Uh, second, we had a meeting uh, over at Ost Engineers, uh, I think it was earlier this week, uh, with two representatives of state government to talk about the Fowler Road project. And s similar to that, uh, you know, we, we find we're, we're, it's very, very tight on the funding for that to get the, the drainage that needs to be done as well as the paving. Uh, it's a total of 640000 that's available for that, of which the council's already set aside 150000 of the, the local share. It's a 25% local share. Uh, that project, we're working with the state. We're looking at the <coughs> state local agreement on it, and we'll be coming back to the council probably at the April meeting with an update on that and exactly what's proposed for you to look at and agree to the scope of the project. I know there was some sense that it was, you'd like to have a bikeway or something like that there, but unfortunately the funding and you know, the, everything else in the budget, the state doesn't have any more money to accomplish something like that, and the, the outlook locally to come up with additional dollars is, is difficult. So you'll have a, a chance to discuss that and look at it at the April meeting. Uh, the third 
paving issue is or road condition issue I think that we get a lot of I'm sure you get a lot of comments about is the condition of Route 77 coming up into the center of town uh, the state has provided uh, actually two sources of funding for us one is in in the paving program for this year they have indicated to us that they have set aside funds to pave Route 77 from the South Portland line all the way out to the first Fowler Road exit just beyond uh, the Pond Cove Millwork. Uh, they've also, through the tax process, set aside funds to pave roughly from Mitchell Road to Cumberland Farms. Now, they've actually funded that section twice, <laughs> un unknowingly. So we're, we're going to be reviewing that with them with the desire that we upgrade their planned paving to a reclamation of that sec section using the extra money so that we do something to improve the road base as well as just uh, the, uh, the paving over and redeveloping the problems as you, you see happen some, some other places when we just pave. So and that would, excuse me, and that would solve the, the frosty problem? It, it, would, it would substantially help. address it. We'd, we'd still, you know, unless we did a total reconstruction, mm -hmm. you would still have some heaving, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it'll be no, you know, if you look at the, the difference in Old Ocean House Road, for instance, mm -hmm. since that was reclaimed, uh, sections, uh, I'm trying to think I was on another one today, uh, oh, the Spurwink, uh, excuse me, Sawyer Road, up uh, across from Elizabeth Farms to back towards Wells Road, that was recently reclaimed, and you can see major, major difference between the, the ones that have been reclaimed in the last few years from the frost eaves of a few years ago to the road conditions now. So, you know, what isn't, what we haven't figured out yet and where there is, doesn't appear to be any money available, uh, there's some issues in Spurwink, particularly as you're going up the hill towards the refuse disposal area. That's in really tough shape. And I'm sure there are individual streets throughout the community, but uh, it's, you know, we, we are looking at those issues and my hope is that during this construction season, we'll be addressing Fowler Road, Broad Cove, and we will try to d d get the state to move forward in Route 77, but the state, you know, they did commit at the meeting and understood that we wanted to follow road this construction season. Uh, we weren't at the level of commitment yet that all of Route 77 would be done. The f f any questions on any of that roads, road issues? No. The third point I wanted to make is just a, I want to thank the council uh, for allowing me to miss last month's council meeting. Uh, I, I, I think it was probably the second regular council meeting I've missed in the 20 years I've been here. And, uh, what I was involved in was training in, in Rotary of district governors who were going to serve Rotary uh, during the year beginning July 1. There were 532 out in California and I was a facilitator in training programs. It was a, it was a fascinating experience. You, it was, uh, you'd have a U-shaped tables and the, the, you'd be working with folks from 15 different countries trying to raise the points out of them to, to learn some of the, the different points of leadership and uh, some of the building membership and some of the other issues. It was a fascinating experience and something that I truly enjoyed and, you know, a, a, an assignment in Rotary that many, many people would love to have at, at that level. So it was, a, it was an honor for me to do it, and I, it, but it couldn't have been done without the council excusing me from attending a meeting. I appreciate that. But Mr. I'll, Chairman, I think what you appreciate uh, is uh, uh, the, what the uh, town clerk did in his absence, and uh, we're pleased that he had the opportunity to go out west. And that was my next point. I'd like, uh, again, to thank Debbie for, uh, and my final point, for all her assistance uh, while I was gone. I left, when I left town, there were a number of emails I sent out, a number of issues that she had to help to address, and uh, she did a fine job, so I want to thank her. So, thank Madam, you, Madam Chairwoman, Chairman. can I add something to that report? I just wanted to say one thing, and that is that what, what uh, Manager McGovern didn't mention is my understanding is that in this entire several hundreds of people that are there, there are only three chosen to be facilitators and leaders, and Mike McGovern was one of them. Three for my class of governors. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, uh, I, I think it is an honor, and we're proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Roberts. We want to get on with our agenda tier, too. <laughs> sure, why not? There are over a million Rotarians worldwide, and uh, there are only 35 of these training leaders, and Michael obviously represented the, the town of Cape Elizabeth very well. He was rated as the number one trainer out of the 35 that were picked, it up, picked from worldwide. So he did himself proud out there and the town. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much. And before we go to the next, next item, I wanted to make note that our two student representatives are here, Student Representative Clucci and Super Representative Aaliyah. 
And uh, also, I wanted the public to note that we have with us this evening as guests who are studying leadership is Troop what? Troop 2221 of Girl Scouts from the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you very much for coming. Um, are there any items not on the agenda for citizens' discussion? Hearing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes or change the minutes of the meeting of February 12, 2001. The pack, your note, minutes are in your packet as delivered. So moved. moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor? Motion carries. Is this speaking to you? Yeah, you don't need to vote on it. Well, but now? You just mentioned it, yeah. Um, I wanted to mention one thing before we go on to items on the agenda you have in your packet, a Take Cape Elizabeth Town Resolution. Uh, almost all the communities in Maine have been a part of this and we are also a part of this and that is that we as the Assembled Town Council have hereby proclaimed that April is Child Abuse Prevention Month in the Town of Cape Elizabeth and in all of Maine and we as our community are part of a greater community to do this. Um, I wanted to mention that we're not making a presentation, but it is a resolution. Item number 74, review and consideration of proposed amendments to the Th Thomas Memorial Library Policy Manual relating to displays and exhibits and to electronic information, electronic services, and network access. All things that we never had to be concerned about before all those high-tech items. We do have somebody from the Library Board of Trustees that I would ask to come forward. And uh, is it Hank Kinsley? Yes. Thank you very much. To just give us a brief overview of your policy changes. There are two policy changes. The first uh, is the uh, the change relating to the displays and exhibits. This is really just to bring the library uh, into accordance with the, the fire codes, uh, the other public buildings in Cape Elizabeth uh, have the same standard. Uh, there have been instances where, uh, according to the, uh, the fire marshal, there was the potential for some citizens to be endangered because there was not clear access to exits and the, uh, the capacity limits had been exceeded. The second amendment regards the uh, electronic information, electronic services network access. This was brought to our attention uh, by the children's librarian um, because there were instances of young students accessing what the librarian felt were inappropriate internet <laughs> sites. They asked us to review uh, the policy and our recommendation is that the computers in the children's library be filtered. The adult library computers would still remain unfiltered so that anybody who needed access to sites that may inadvertently have been filtered, for example, students who were doing research on breast cancer or something like that, would still have access to unfiltered computers in the adult library. Is that, was the three? Uh, no, I believe just the two. The, oh, uh, just the two. Displays and exhibits and the electronic information. Okay, fine. We have a couple of questions, yeah, Councilman yeah, McGinsey. It may be kind of nitpicky. I once, uh, just a basic question popped out at me. Um, on page one of displays and exhibits policy, um, under exhibit space number one, it says that the exhibit, exhibits to be displayed at the owner's risk and are not covered by library insurance. And it just seemed odd to me. I mean, if there was a fire or something at the library, heaven forbid, um, wouldn't our insurance in some way cover that loss or? or I don't know. I mean, I, I'm wondering if we, how can we opt out and say, um, Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I left my jacket in the library and I ran out in the fire and it burned, you know, I might want rep, you know uh, reimbursement for my jacket. But if people have their their photos or art on display, we're not going to cover that. It just it seemed odd to me for some reason. I think the manager can comment on that. Yeah. We we do carry 
$30,000 worth of coverage for rotating exhibits. However, you know, I think what's important about this policy is that there's no guarantee that, that it is insured or, or will be in place, and the expectation should be that it, that it will not be insured. It covers us, you know, there, there are examples of, I know when we've had art exhibits over there, I remember there was a Jean Leger a few years ago, they had a lot of original, beautiful original artwork, and it was probably a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of art. We didn't have, we didn't guarantee insurance to cover all of that. Okay. So that, that's the, okay, we, okay. we do have insurance, but not, we don't guarantee it. Okay. okay. And it's in a, because we don't want to get into disputes either with the values of different pieces and some of those issues. Okay, that's, that's fair. Another question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, on page two of that same policy, and again, it just struck me, struck me as uh, odd, maybe it's the phrasing, on number four, it's actually the second paragraph on that page, but it's number four. It says, as a nonprofit organization, and it kind of struck me as odd. Uh, I mean, it's really a municipal, it's a municipal agency Art. department. Thank you. A municipal department. That's not a nonprofit organization. Again, maybe I'm nitpicking here, but it just it just seemed the wording jumped out at me. You see what I'm looking at? Mm -hmm. On the on yeah, four on the second page. Right, on the same policy. Have there been objections from citizens about prices being on paintings or anything like that? I just didn't know why this change was. Where, what was the motivation for making that change? Part of the motivation was apparently the librarians and the library staff had been put in the position of becoming art dealers for people <laughs> who wanted to purchase things off the wall or dicker on prices and things like that. And really felt that that was not business that we had any place in being any part of whatsoever. So um, any purchase and sale of the artwork you prefer to be between the artist and the consumer privately. But if that was said, rather than no prices could be available or no list could be available, I mean, they could simply say, you have to contact the artist. But it, I, I, it seems like a very nice thing to have a list of prices there for the artwork. You still have I mean, it's. It. <coughs> you can still have a list, can't you? I, I mean, is this saying that no, they can't even have no it on site? No distribution of a price list. Oh. Okay, well, it's... That, well, if the artist is displaying it, or if the artist is distributing it, that's not the library doing it. If the, la the artist is present, isn't that what you're aiming at? You want your relationship between the artist and the consumer, not having library personnel involved in the transaction. Correct. I think that's clear. But, but according to this, it also means off off the premises the way I... Yes. We're not displaying artwork to help the artist sell their artwork. I think okay. what the difference is it's intended to be an art gallery for display purposes and not an art shop for sales purposes. Councillor Roberts? Councillor McGinty asked my question. Um, I was, I was wondering if the Arts Commission carried the insurance on that, where the library wasn't. But I believe, uh, if I might add, just on the, on the last comment here, the Arts Commission, to my, I believe, sponsors most of these showings at the library. And they're trying to promote art in general, and not necessarily the sale of it, but the appreciation of it. I think that's more why they're displaying it at the library, because it's a, a good public location where people can see it and enjoy it. Are there any more questions of this, of the trustee? Well, I, I personally have no objection to having the list there or not there. I don't really care, you know. But um, I would just urge you uh, to monitor the staff to see if they start getting complaints about the prices being taken away, you know, because I, I think there's an, a less of an overkill kind of way to solve the problem with the librarians than right. to just say no list, no prices, whatever. But, you know, it's not a big issue for me. I don't really, I don't care about this one too much. If it's a big deal for the librarians and it's driving them crazy, it's fine for me as long as it doesn't start to drive clients, users of the library who go there to look at the art crazy.
crazy. So if if we just you know if you guys just sort of be aware of whether it's you start getting any complaints. If nobody even notices, it's <laughs> like not even an issue. I mean, Councilor I, Barry, I, I, sorry. Well, to move this along, I would like to move that uh, the council adopt the uh, policies uh, proposed in uh, the two cases as read and uh, as presented to us. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? Councillor McGinty. I, I don't know who made the comment, but somebody said this hadn't come up before about the filters, and it actually has come up before. It came yeah. up about four years ago. And uh, I feel kind of vindicated on this because four <laughs> years ago, the vote was six to one not to em employ the filters, and I was the one person who wanted to employ the filters. And I'm glad that this has come <laughs> back around, um, apparently with a new board of trustees. And uh, the arguments are the same then as they are now. Um, I felt that the children should not have that unfettered access to the Internet. Um, and I'm glad I agree 100 percent with this <laughs> policy. <laughs> so I might add that, that, that only three members of that council are on the council now. So I can't indict the entire council. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you John. <laughs> Councilor Fritz, did you have a comment? Well, I, I'm just wondering whether po policy four, I mean the, the fourth on the second page about the, having price lists available. I mean, was that a unanimous uh, agreement of the commission? I do not recall. The, the Let me trustee? see if I got that in my minutes. Um, that, that policy was adopted by the Board of Trustees, I would say, about six months ago. I, I do know, Madam Chairman, while Hank looks for that, that I specifically asked Jay Sherma had it, in addition to the trustees, had it also been reviewed and approved by the Arts Commission? And the indication from Jay Shermer uh, to that point is that it had been reviewed and approved by the Arts Commission in addition to the trustees. So they did because it seems to me it might, I, I find the displays very, very nice going into the library. And I mean, I understand that artists would like to have their, their work displayed, and, it's, and that's one of the motivations to provide, you know, I mean, they're providing the public with some nice artwork and things to look at when they go in the library, and we might have less interest in displaying that. And that would take away, I think, from the, the cultural aspect of, of that display. Um, so. I'm, I'm just wondering how strongly it's felt and whether this might be talked about again in light of what we've said and maybe come back another. I think that that's always a, they, they can certainly bring it back. I, I myself have never served in the Arts Commission, nor have, I, nor have I served as a trustee of the library. So I have to believe that after much discussion and the minutes, which you may or may not have with you tonight, that the library, that those two groups have given this some thought. And where I tend to agree with you that it doesn't seem like a very big deal to me, I would have them there. But they must have very strong reasons if they wish to put that in their policy. So at this point, my position is that I would agree with their recommendation. And if this is not going to work, they'll have to re re readdress that policy. But they, I'd like to put my start, confidence in those citizen committees. If they start getting complaints, yeah. I'm sure they'll rethink their yeah. position. Yeah. I, I would. Yeah. I don't know if you're still looking, but I, I just... I don't believe no, I have that's the... Right. I, I, I just, oh. like, no. as a form... Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I can't... I just, we lost track here. As, I, I used to be on the library board, and we talked about this a number of times, um, and I just want to thank the library board and, and Jay Sherma and the staff, because I'm sure they labored mightily mm -hmm. over this issue, the filtering issue, not the arts issue. Mm -hmm. um, we labored over both of them. Oh, well, <laughs> the filtering one, I know, was a labor for us and then I got elected here and <laughs> to sign off of that particular labor but um, these po this, this policy modification I know was a real tricky one to figure out and um, I just want to thank you because I know you guys spent a lot of time on it and I want to thank you for your work as well as the people who work at the library um, who work to make sure that the library remains a good information resource for all Cape citizens so thanks we don't often get an opportunity, and even though I like to keep the meeting moving, but we don't often get an opportunity to ask our student representatives or the Girl Scouts representatives, if you have if you've thought about this opinion, do you, know what he's, do you understand what he's talking about in the filtering of the Internet? 
just curious if the students had any thoughts on this. Hearing none at this point, I'll move on. <laughs> I think that as long as some, I don't think that it would be right to filter all the computers, but as long as people have access somewhere in the library to non filtered computers, I, I mean, I, I don't see anything entirely wrong with it, I think. But what, what we're talking about is filtering the, the computers in the children's, children's library. Right, right, that's what so I So she's yeah. agreeing. Yes, would be. <laughs> Thank you. We, we have one Girl Scout representative that's going to comment. Thank you very much to have your opinion heard among the citizens in the town, both of you. Um, okay, are there any more, is there any more discussion on this uh, item? Is there any more questions? Is, has it been moved? Mm -hmm. It's been moved and seconded, so I'll, is, if, Councilor I, Fritz? I just want to <laughs> say that I, I am going to have to vote against mm -hmm. um, eliminating the prices. I, I just think that, um, from the artwork, um, I think it's a nice outlet for artists. I think it's a nice thing to have in our library. I hate to have it um, uh, restricted, and I don't, I think some lesser um, measures could be taken, um, and I, I want to know the prices of the pictures without having to call the artist for each one. I think okay. this. Councilor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, I believe that we need to support our boards and commissions. We have bright people on those committees, and I will be supporting it. As proposed. Let's call the question, Councillor Barry. Yeah, just on that, it says allow the display or distribution of a price list. Does that mean that you can't uh, put the price of a particular painting on that painting? I believe the objective was that there would not be price tags on no paintings, price at all, and nor would there be a master list posted on the wall or at the librarian's nope. desk. Thank you. We ready to call the question? All those in favor? Opposed? Six to one. Thank you. Item number 75, report from the Appointments Committee recommending candidates for the Community Center Planning Committee and the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation Board of Directors. They were in your packet. I will ask Councillor Roberts to make a brief report on the people who are going to be on those committees. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Over the uh, past month or so, the uh, appointments Committee has met on several dates, interviewing people and trying to bring forward a good slate of names for both of these. The first committee that I would uh, like to propose the, uh, the membership for will be the Community Center Planning Committee. And I would like to read the committee purpose for the viewing audience and for the people in the, uh, in the hall tonight so they know what this uh, committee is supposed to be doing. Um, as you know, the town recently purchased the Pond Cove Millworks building. Uh, to house the community services program. The committee being put together is to prepare a recommended plan for the use of the property at 343 Ocean House Road, including the possibility of shared municipal school, retail, and residential uses. In preparing the plan, the committee shall, uh, shall seek input from citizens and shall consult with area neighbors. 
develop a cost estimate for any proposed alterations to the buildings and for any site changes, make a recommendation to the Town Council on the disposition and or use of the current community center at 1226 Shore Road, and whether the property should be retained as municipal property or sold, and submit a report to the Town Council no later than July 31, 2001. And obviously they have their work in front of them in order to get a report back in that short of time. The committee, that the uh, appointments committee felt that uh, we had, we really wanted to have a student representative in this mix. And we had two uh, young folks from the high school that had applied and we felt very strongly that we'd like to, to amend the, the charge to allow for an alternate and we'd like to appoint uh, one of the students as the, as the voting member of the committee, <coughs> with the second being the alternate. Uh, I will give you the names of the people that we have for the full slate at this point. Uh, Gilbert Jordan, uh, Kathy Perkins will be a community services uh, appointee, Andy Strout, uh, Mike Walsh would be the student uh, representative, Mary Jean Mork, Elaine Maloney would be the school representative. Jennifer Rice DeSena would be a school representative. And Kara Jordan would be the, the alternate for the, uh, that, in the school position or the student one that we have selected. Uh, with that, uh, as I say, we've interviewed all these people. We were impressed with all of them. And we think this would be a great committee. So I would recommend that the council accept uh, the slate as presented. And I know that there are two, uh, the, the chairwoman of the council also had two nominees. Do you want me to list those as well? Yes, I've appointed two councillors and they've agreed to serve, John McGinty and Carol Fritz. All right, so I would move that the slate as listed be appointed as the uh, Community Center Planning Committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll accept the slate. All those in favor? Opposed? It's a unanimous decision. Thank you very much. And I thank all of those people for serving on what could be an interesting um, committee. <laughs> the second uh, committee that we needed to fill was the uh, Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. This will be a group uh, that we, the council voted on several months ago now to try and make uh, Fort Williams a self-supporting entity. They will be charged with the responsibility of actually going out into the community and soliciting uh, funds, donations, grants, any other type of funding that they can come across uh, that would take the burden off in the local, local property tax and supplement the funds that we currently get from the museum. But the upgrading of the park, that's the areas that the, uh, the museum are not supposed to be doing would be covered by this particular committee. We have... Um, the following people have agreed to serve on that committee and again want to thank them very much and I think they're a, a good group of, of professional people that will do the, uh, do the trust or the foundation proud and uh, do, do a great job with it. Uh, we have Penelope Robinson, Richard Kurtz, Glenn Israel, John Sears, Jeff Van Fleet, Penelope Carson will be the council rep and Clint Blood will be the uh, the final member of that group. So I would move that we uh, uh, approve them to be the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation members. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing that, we'll call the question. All those in favor? None opposed. Thank you very much. We got some terrific people, as usual. Cape Elizabeth is standing out with a number of people who volunteer to serve on our committees. I think that uh, I look forward to serving on the Charitable Foundation. Hope we can raise a lot of money. <laughs> um, Us too. So do we. Yes, <laughs> and I'm sure the council think, hope really so hope too. So. Uh, I still think it's one of the finest municipal parks in the country, and so I think it's great that we have this kind of support for it. Uh, item number 76. Um, these are the requests that come in annually from various organizations. I'm going to have the manager report on this, although you have the packet. These are the requests from various organizations who wish to use Fort Williams Park for a variety uh, of events. This is always a, a difficult decision, I think, sometimes for the Fort Williams Advisory Committee because when you have large groups in there, it 
sometimes takes parts of the public park out of use for members of the public. On the other hand, these are always entertaining things that members of the public can attend. Manager McGovern, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I would like to point out that this year we really have tried to put these before you all at the same time so that you could, you could get the full picture. Uh, in addition to this list, there is one other event that's not on this list that we believe was previously approved by the Council, and that's the Beach to Beacon Road Race, which will be the first uh, mm. Saturday in August. So if you add that to the list, uh, that gives you the complete list of what, what will be coming up this year with your approval. Uh, the first item is for the use, the, the continued Little League use. There's really no change from the past and how they would be using the park. Uh, the high school graduation on June 10th. Family Fun Day will be June 16th. The Portland Symphony Orchestra has requested a use on June 29th. The Coast Guard has asked for a change of command ceremony on the uh, field next to Portland Headlight on July 12th. Northern Sky Toys, a business in Portland, has asked for permission for kite flies on April 15, June 17, September 8th, and October 14th. Uh, Engine One Company hopes to have the Labor Day weekend art show on Sunday, se September 2nd or if it's raining the following day. The Downey's Cast Classic Car Show, something we've seen quite a few years, September 9th or the following week if it's raining. And the American Can Cancer Society wishes to have a walk against breast cancer on October 14th. These have all been recommended, as you mentioned, by the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Move for passage. Second. <coughs> it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? I would like to ask the manager one question. Uh, with these, some of these are, re most of these are return organizations. Have you ever had any issues with any of these groups that make it difficult to approve or have been problematic in some way to the town? <laughs> well, I'd say in, in some years we've had some issues with all of them. <laughs> 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 but the, the one in, of, in recent time that some questions have been raised about is uh, item F, the Northern Sky Toys kite flies. There's been some concern expressed about the, the large sizes of some of these kites in the back can come crashing down and, and uh, injure someone. And we have tried to work very closely with the owner of this company. It's, it seems to be an event that people enjoy seeing the kites and flying them, but we do monitor it for the safety of the public and we'll continue to watch it quite closely. And he has been uh, cautioned uh, that, you know, even though these dates are granted, that safety is of paramount concern. Have we, have we ever had any accidents? With these kites? To my knowledge, no. Somebody? No more discussion. I'll move the question. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Uh, item number 77. Is that where I am? Item number 77. Consider approval of the dog warrant for the year 2001. We forgot to discuss the town council's uh, concerns and issues with dogs in Cape Elizabeth when we were coming together with our little list. I'd like to ask the... Uh, Town Clerk, please, Deborah Lane. Thank you very much. This is the annual dog warrant um, that directs the animal control officer, really in conjunction with my office, to give final notification to those folks that have not relicensed their dogs for 2001. Tomorrow, final cards, uh, which is formal notification to these folks, will be going out. They will have seven days to register their dogs. If they fail to do so, uh, they are subject to for further court action by the animal control officer. Uh, again, my office um, will be working very closely with the animal control officer and chief of police to follow up on all of these. Must so I would recommend it. I'm sorry. Yeah, recommend no. that you sign the warrant as presented. Thank you. I, I have to add that if it wasn't for the town clerk who sends me <laughs> several emails and several telephone calls and practically lays my dog licenses out on the counter for me to pay for, I would often forget, as I have. <laughs> so, um, Councillor Barry. I would like to move. Uh, approval of the dog warrant for the year 2001. Second. And I have uh, registered my dog each year. <laughs> <laughs> when I had two of them, I registered them both <laughs> appropriately and timely. Madam Chairwoman, may I ask the town clerk? Uh, mm -hmm. okay. There aren't any elected officials or municipal employees on that list, I hope. <laughs> I don't think any longer. I think we've taken care of that. You want to take the Fifth Amendment there, yeah. uh, Jack, or something? Again, there were some emails that went out and friendly reminders before. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? None. That carries. 
I hope that the Girl Scouts will stay for just a few more minutes because the manager is going to do a, what do you call it? Presentation. A presentation of the budget. Point, point. What do you call it? PowerPoint, PowerPoint discussion. Point. Item number 78, presentation of the proposed fiscal year 2002 municipal budget which, and referral to the Finance Committee. I'm, I'm sure that you're all fascinated and you can't wait to hear it, but you might stay a couple minutes more that you can at least see it. Do we move? No, we can just sort of turn around, or you can move down, whichever, depending on, on the wall. We might have to move. Unfortunately, the TV lights seem to be heating up so badly that they were. I'll try to speak loudly so that the TV microphone picks up my voice. Excuse me for a second. Let me get a mic Have they got a portal? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to give an overview of the, the proposed fiscal year 2002 municipal budget. I think so, so far in the press there's been a lot of discussion thus far about the school budget, but there's been actually very little about the municipal budget. And The good news is that although the municipal budget is, in, is increasing, its, its impact on the tax rate is nowhere near the same as the proposed uh, school budget. I'd like to first cover the revenue side, and it's, it's kind of odd that I start by quoting myself, but I think it's one of the most important things that needs to be thought of as we look at this municipal budget. Quite frankly, I've never been so nervous about projecting revenues in the municipal budget as I have for this particular year. There is a very real possibility that in fiscal year 2002 that projected revenues will not be met. We have been seeing, even since most of these budget numbers were prepared two years ago, a significant downturn in income, particularly for motor vehicle excise tax. It was down about 10 percent in February from the previous February. And we're also fearful that it will be reflected in state revenue sharing and in other areas. And obviously, the stock market uh, of the last few weeks hasn't been helpful. And it will be interesting to see the consumer confidence report in February. But uh, there is in my feel, absolutely no room in this budget to further increase projected revenues unless there's a new fee or something like that is proposed. I'd like to briefly review, uh, try to get away from uh, the fee feedback on this. Uh, the, one of the major revenues is the excise tax. Uh, again, that's proposed to go up about $54,000. That's in thousands. Uh, whether or not it's going to do that, uh, we don't know. The last two months, March, is, well, we don't have the numbers yet, but it looks extremely quiet, and uh, that uh, $1.559 million could be a stretch. The pool and fitness center, uh, the revenues are projected to go up about uh, $30,000. That includes an additional charge to Coastal Maine Aquatics for their use of the pool and primarily a, a look at all the other, the other revenues. There, are, there aren't really fee increases. State revenue sharing proposed to go up just a minuscule amount. That's mainly because of the, the new revenue sharing, revenue sharing two program that was enacted uh, by the legislature last year. Uh, the revenue sharing account, though, has been impacted by the fact that the state sales tax, which was formerly 6 percent, was lowered to 5.5 percent and then to 5 percent and we do get a share of uh, those sales tax incomes on a, on a formula basis. Investment income, that's proposed to increase 45000 That's primarily from looking historically at what we've earned from investment income. And uh, again, interest rates are trending lower, uh, so that uh, is not an area that has uh, upward potential. Uh, permit income, we're projecting to be relatively flat. We're still hopeful that Cross Hill will be continuing to, to move forward. Uh, that is, that's building permit income. We do receive some small other uh, permit income, but that particular line there, permit income. Do you have a question, Ann? Yes, I just, if you could just clarify for the public whether those numbers for 2001 are the budgeted numbers for fiscal year 01, or they are your estimate of what the actual yes. will turn out to be. 
those are the budgeted numbers and uh, interestingly they're going to be very close uh, you know the, the biggest one there is excise tax and I was looking earlier when the budget was first put together of a slight you know ten fifteen thousand above that but it's now looking like that one million five oh five uh, depending on the economy the next few months could okay. be uh, I, I just know we were having some downward trend in we are. things and I didn't yeah. know if we you thought we were going to meet some of those budgeted numbers for this I'm, year. I'm now beginning to have my doubts okay. uh, most of these numbers were put together in January and uh, you know the last two weeks have not been promising in terms of no. looking at revenues and other issues uh, the municipal tax rate uh, is 4.47 this this year it was last year the the budget provides for a proposed 13 cent in increase to four dollars and sixty cents for municipal services this is an increase uh, last year there was no increase in the municipal budget this would be an increase of two point nine one percent but if anyone looks at their overall tax bill as opposed to just the municipal side it's six tenths of one percent this is also a good time to mention that the county budget is separate from the municipal budget in this year's presentation and the comparable numbers also are out of 2001 when you add the county budget that adds an additional nine cents in addition to the 13 cents so all of the municipal budget for all of the different priorities and issues you'll see have a 13 cent increase on the tax rate and then the county alone with you know from whom we actually received very few services has a has a nine uh, nine cent increase and just so people are in the public are aware approximately 70 percent of the county budget is for the jail the that's, Cumberland County Jail that's right and that's what's driving mm -hmm. a lot of the increase mm -hmm. in their budget yep. the municipal budget is funded primarily from three sources first the property tax 48 percent excise tax income when when you come into the town hall and you're you're handed information and you you groan at how much your excise tax is you can see that actually does fund the municipal budget and if it if it was not paid in excise it would be paid, it would likely be paid in property tax so it, it is you know part of the overall pie as you see here state and federal sources primarily state revenue sharing adds 14 percent and everything else all the fees the pool fees the, the permit income uh, investment income all of those things add up to 16 percent of the budget interestingly enough the property tax has has fluctuated between 47 and 52 53 percent for almost the entire last 20 years as a percentage of the municipal budget on the expenditure side 48 percent of the municipal budget goes to personnel pay and benefits uh, 16 percent goes to debt service 10 percent to capital outlay some of the larger things that we purchase interestingly enough we focus an awful lot on contracted services and you know hiring from you know things from the outside that's only eight percent of the budget disposal fees is seven percent and all of the commodities that we buy salt sand uh, so many of uh, the different things that we do office supplies everything else that only adds up to eleven percent of the budget so the big bulk is is in personnel and I'd say the major change in this pie in the last few years is that debt service used to be around nine percent of the budget it is now up to sixteen percent of the budget that's that's quite a shift uh, the increases in the budget you know, the different changes the the budget overall is up uh, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars that's five point two five percent the greatest increase is in the area of pay and benefits two hundred and seventy one thousand uh, debt service is for the all of the projects that have been going on the public new public works garage the new ball fields over at the Gulf Crest farm the fire station being renovated in the police station adds up to seventy seven thousand and also the pool and fitness center uh, is up sixty one thousand dollars primarily because of uh, electricity the pool uses a lot more electricity than it we thought it was going to use when it was when it was built uh, although the net impact on taxes though you remember the revenue side the revenues are up thirty thousand so that has a that has a thirty thousand dollar impact on taxes the pool and fitness center just the operating portion of that which interestingly enough is almost half of what the debt service 
increases in this year's budget. That, that was a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, the decreases in the capital budget, I strongly regretted uh, having to reduce capital outlay by 54000 That was to provide for a tax increase of less than 3%. The rescue unit is now an enterprise unit, uh, an enterprise fund. It was formally subsidized by the general fund uh, at the $17,000 level. It is, it is now self-supporting. So that, that general fund contribution is no longer necessary. Uh, professional services, that shows only a $6,000 increase, but even it would have shown a $16,000 increase, except for the fact that we're helping the schools with some network assistance for their computer work uh, with an increase of $10,000. You mean decrease? decrease. Uh, de thank you, John. Yeah, we're increasing $10,000 to the school department, and it would have shown, without that, it would have shown a decrease of $16,000. Excuse me, Mike, if you could um, point out for the viewers, give an example of what you mean by capital outlay, just for people who wouldn't Thank know. Thank you. Capital outlay, uh, everything from police cruises to paving, uh, paving is, is the biggest one, to all of the equipment we buy that we expect to have around us uh, for 10 years or more, with the exception of police cruises, that we, we fund two of them in the budget each year. Uh, the town manager changes in this year's budget from when the, what the department heads first proposed during the capital improvement plan last year, I reduced $720,000. In over 20 years, I've never reduced anywhere near that amount. Uh, all of that was needed. Uh, you know, I discussed earlier this evening some paving. Uh, Bob Malley had originally projected a paving budget of about $320,000. Uh, excuse me, 520,000. I had reduced that to 365,000. I think anyone who travels the roads of Cape Elizabeth know that that full amount could have been utilized with some of the reconstruction work that needs to be done. If, but yet, if I hadn't made those changes, we would have been looking at a dollar uh, 13 cent increase instead of 13 cents. And I make that point because this budget has already been aggressively looked at to meet what we anticipated was the council desire to keep the tax rate increase as low as possible. This is, is an extremely difficult year, and as I alluded to at the beginning, particularly with revenues, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult by the day in terms of doing that. Nonetheless, I, I'm not proposing at this point in time look, looking again at the revenues to decrease the projected amounts. I, I reserve the right to change that opinion but at this point, I'd rather, as we get into the fiscal year, uh, look to see if we need to make some corrections based on economic points at that time. We also have a debate every year on how much surplus we ought to have, and it's primarily, that's why we have a surplus, just in case we get one of these years where, uh, where we have a, a bit of an economic uh, pause. Uh, this is just a... a a photo, actually an image of the, a painting mock-up of the new police station that's going across the street. And, and I put that up there because, you know, despite the sad tone of, of this budget message and the rather <laughs> melancholy aspect of it, we, we're still accomplishing an awful lot that we can be proud of and that the community can be proud of. Uh, the new public works garage, the citizens who, who went up to that open house uh, month or so ago just were very appreciative of what they saw and the manner in which that was done. The fire station, uh, the old public works garage is making a lot of progress. And, you know, we're a little bit worried still that not everyone quite realizes that the old fire station across the street from the town hall is due to be torn down in a couple of months and this building will be built in its place. We, we frankly expect, you know, some eyebrows raised, particularly because that's going to be happening the same month that you're adopting the municipal budget. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, particularly at the staff level, we feel that this is a building that's long overdue that is uh, something that the community is going to be extremely proud of. And uh, it's, it's, as you can see, it's a very attractive building, and uh, we look forward a year from now of, of opening that building. So despite, you know, all the, the, the manager getting up, you know, saying, you know, that this is difficult, the citizens, you know, are contributing an awful lot two taxes that will accomplish an awful lot as well. Everything from the snow plowing, you know, that routinely happens to such things as getting this building completed. 
just a, a brief overview. I think the, as we go through this budget process, working with Councilor Ann Swift Kayotter and the Finance Committee, made up of the Council as a whole, I, I, I'm going to remind you several times through the process that we've already restrained ourselves quite a bit uh, as, we've, as the budget has come to this point to you. The budget also, even with that, does implement long-range plans. Is always concerned that are you looking out long-term? And all of these building projects have been discussed for years, and they're now being implemented as a result of a long-term plan. We're also, there's still funding in there for hazardous materials disposal. There's still some funding there for Greenbelt. There's still some funding for taking care of computers. And particularly, there's also funding for adequate pay levels for employees. Because if we don't invest in our personnel, you know, in a way that is, is comparative with other communities and other positions, we're going to have all sorts of problems. And we, we look at the storms, we look at all the different positions throughout uh, municipal as well as our school department. The school department last year made great progress on looking at different pay levels. We're, we're very, we were very, we weren't surprised actually, we just did a pay study and we showed we had some real problems, particularly with our lower paid personnel. And it was manifesting itself in people leaving positions that would open up two and three times a year. And this, this budget uh, has $40,000 within it that helps to address some of those uh, issues with pay. And of course, the comment above there, more funds are needed for paving. Uh, yeah, I don't know where we're going to find them, but uh, we'll keep looking at it. We also need to be concerned looking at this budget of where is future revenue. Uh, growth is slowing down in Cape Elizabeth. You know, other than Cross Hill, the only thing that's really going on is major reconstruction of homes. You know, Cape Elizabeth, with all the open space that's been acquired, is going to see an awful lot of demand for folks to renovate homes, to enlarge homes, to, to make them more of the standards of, of this particular decade. Uh, we're already seeing a number of, uh, we're already in the main Supreme Court on at least one case from a neighbor trying to stop another neighbor from building a, a house. As we look at all these issues, you know, we need to recall, we need to reflect upon the fact that Cape Elizabeth is be beginning to be built out and much of the future revenue is going to be from reuse and reconstruction of existing properties. And you know, when attempts are made to prohibit reuse and uh, reconstruction of existing properties, if it's slowed down too much, it's going to have an impact on the value of those properties, but it's also going to stop future revenue growth. So, you know, I know there's a lot of issue with sprawl in the state, and, you know, one way to stop sprawl is to allow people to do with their homes uh, what, what they want to do to continue to make them livable by their standards today. So I, I raise that point because as you're making decisions on some of those issues in the next year, they have major revenue impacts in terms of, you know, you, you have to make a choice of do we allow these folks to build these homes larger and do some of these things, uh, or if we, you don't allow it, because if you don't allow it, there's also not going to be money uh, for other things. We're also, you know, again, having to be, look, I think the rescue is a good example of, you know, that does have an impact on this year's budget in terms of the shift to a, uh, a, an enterprise fund. Oftentimes we sit at budget sessions and, oh, Michael, you don't need so much money for salt. You don't need so much money for sand. And this is a, re I, I just couldn't go the evening with a reminder that bad winters do happen, and uh, as we've seen that. Uh, one reason why I felt confident reducing $720,000 and why we're still able to do so much is that the council has always been very dedicated, has very been aggressive in working on the budget. We have boards, as you saw this evening, that, that give a lot of volunteer talent uh, to the community. The employees uh, have just been tremendous, uh, so many of them uh, throughout the organization in uh, working together to, to provide efficient service without a whole lot of fuss. Uh, the volunteers that do so much in the community and the citizens. Cape Elizabeth is really a town that works together. Uh, with the school department uh, and just amongst everyone. And it really does make a difference and it, it does have budgetary impacts. Uh, in closing, uh, this final slide is just an image I've always liked. And, you know, it, it's, it's a view of the earth from the moon. 
And, you know, as, as I often think, as I look at all our issues and problems, you know, we're a very small speck in the universe. <laughs> While it is the most important speck in the universe, uh, nonetheless, I think we ought to put everything into perspective. We're, we're a place with tremendous riches in terms of our environment, in terms of our people, and in, in terms of all the, the material things that we have. So, you know, despite, you know, some of, you know, the, the, the words that might rise as we go through this budget process, I think we have to recall that really we're, we're, we're very prosperous and fortunate to be living where we are, when we are. And finally, at the very bottom, you see the Cape Elizabeth website address. And that was just a reminder to me that if anyone wishes to see all the details of the municipal budget, it is downloadable uh, from, from the website. The, the entire uh, outline of the municipal budget is on there. No one needs to call us. They, as long as they have Adobe Acrobat, uh, they'll be all set. I'd like to thank Wendy Derzewick for her help in posting that. So that's an overview of the municipal budget. I, I truly look forward to reviewing it. And again, want to thank everyone for their, uh, their help up to this point. So thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, if, um, if I could add to uh, Mr. McGovern's presentation, I, I would like to echo his thought that it's going to be a very challenging year. I look forward to working with the rest of the Finance Committee on the Town Council to working on the municipal budget. The manager. That's okay. I want to thank the manager and his staff for their efforts to put together a lean budget for us. I think it involved some pain, and I want that <laughs> noted. Um, we will be having, we on the council will be having a series of public meetings, workshops, but they are open to the public uh, starting March 26th on the budget, where we will be going through it with all our questions and all our work and trying to figure out the best way to meet the needs of the town. Um, and I invite members of the public who are interested to come see that process at work. It's uh, government at its most grassrootsian. So um, I also want to wish the school board well in their efforts. I know they have been working uh, to try and pare down their budget. They have some special challenges because of uh, special education uh, money, which they are mandated by the federal government to provide certain services, and that's, that's challenging for them. And they are also getting hard, hit hard, as Councillor Watson said, by the lack of state aid this year. But I want to wish them well in their efforts, and we will work together with them to make sure that the, the town gets the best bang for their buck in the budget. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to refer this, the uh, 2002 municipal budget, to the Finance Committee. Madam Chairman. Councillor Barry. I move that the proposed uh, fiscal year 2002 municipal budget uh, be referred to the Finance Committee. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Item number 79, presentation of the proposed fiscal year 2002 special funds budget and, and referral to the Finance Committee. I'd like to say a few things about that now, okay? I'll entertain a motion to refer that to the Finance Committee. Councillor Barry. I, I move also that uh, that budget be uh, referred to the Finance Committee. Second. There's a second over here someplace. We have a second also somewhere. Downloadable. Also downloadable uh, on your computer. Um, if you have a lot of paper. Yeah. yeah, if you have a lot of paper. It's been moved and seconded to refer the special funds budget to the Finance Committee. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. Item number 80, receipt of the municipal pay study prepared by Michael Wing, who is an independent counsel, consultant hired by the community. We are to acknowledge and receive this. I must admit that it was very fascinating. I particularly did enjoy it, and I think we will be able to use that in our deliberations, or at least make reference to it. It's appropriate to acknowledge and to receive this document. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded to acknowledge and receipt the special municipal pay study report prepared by Michael Wing. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. Item number 81, a request to authorize the issuance of a request for proposals for town hall area landscape improvements. I just wanted to comment that uh, I for some reason, have, really do have a very particular interest in this. I really would like to see it, you know, a plan in place. 
I'm not sure when we will come to it, but you'll see in your packet that we can put out the RFP to several landscape architects. And um, I think we have an historic building here that's in the middle of the new town center area. And I would like to see what kinds of possibilities there are to improve the look, the grassy area around it or whatever. So, and I have asked uh, Councillor Barry to serve on that um, subcommittee with me, which is mostly just to, to listen to the proposals as they come forward before we present them to the council. Which I have happily accepted. Thank you. So, um, the packet, yes, Councillor McGinty, it's... Um. I don't know if we can fund it, but we can certainly see the plan. That, that was my question, right? Yeah. There. What, what's this going to cost? Well, who knows? Yeah. Oh, you mean that? We yeah, well, this, this process to start with, I mean, it seems by the presentation we just saw that there's not a lot of money out there floating around to do um, a lot more than what we're doing right now. Um, you know, we just, uh, uh, what's this process just to get a plan, a proposal? Is that going to cost us? You want to talk? Yeah. It won't cost us anything to we issue just, the request for proposals, right. but I think we, we do need to be cognizant of the fact that if we're sending it out to six firms, they will have a cost of staff time and, and their resources in preparing uh, the proposals to submit to us. We will know once they submit it to us what the cost is to develop the plan. Uh, my, my, rec my sense, I discussed this with the council chairman today, is that she and perhaps another councillor and another citizen or two will be will review the proposals along with myself and make a recommendation to the council on on one to, to do the work uh, where the money is going to come from to to actually do the planning uh, quite frankly I haven't identified those funds as of yet because I, I don't one I don't know how they uh, how much it is and two uh, uh, I, I want to look to see some you know, some of our other capital projects and how they're doing uh, this isn't the best time to do this. I, mm. I know that, but I do recognize, and I think it's important, it was a council goal for this year, and uh, I really feel it's, it's, it's important for the council to do this. Plus it also, you know, I think the real issue here is whether or not the, serv the former service station lot in, in back of the council podium, whether or not that's going to be retained by the town or not. And until a process like this is done, it seeing whether or not we need that or if it fits into a master plan, it's going to be difficult to answer that question. And, you know, this may result in that something happening on that lot. It may result in a recommendation for it being sold. I don't know. But until there's some planning and a look done at that lot as it relates to this lot, we don't know. So, you know, I, I think it's a good council goal that, that you did this. And, uh, but I do, I do recognize that, uh, one, I don't know yet where the money's going to come from, nor do I know yet how much the money is, nor do I know yet once they propose something, if they do, I don't know what that cost would be, nor how it would be funded. So there's a lot of unknowns. But so for us to, to solicit these proposals costs us nothing. No, but it does cost the private firms. And if I were you, I wouldn't issue it unless you thought there was some chance that you, you might move with the next step, because it wouldn't be fair to the firms. As I was reading the silver, I was wondering why we were doing this prior to making a decision on the lot. That, that was my first impression. that. I, for one, would actually like to see us sell that lot. That's just a, I know that's not a council vote at this point, uh, to use that revenue to go towards some of our other needs. But the other thing I was thinking of uh, when I was reading over it, a lot of different design studies have been done in a contest fashion. Where we get the, at SMTC, they have the landscape design uh, classes there. Um, the Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. was designed on a contest type of a thing where people submitted their plans. And I wondered if that, in order to save some money, isn't a, a possibility that we could ask for people interested and have some kind of an award for the, for the winning presentation or whatever, if there's any merit in that, or is that totally off the wall? <laughs> it's I've discussed approaches <laughs> like that with the professional community at different times. And, you know, unless it's a huge project with status that they can see potential future revenue down the road, they, they tend not to respond, particularly if, if it's in a busy economic time. And interestingly, these firms, they downsized significantly in the 90s, and they never, you know, they've been real busy, and they generally don't like to do it. The other thing with this is one of the major issues with this, it's not so much the design as it, as it is the elevation and drainage. 
Uh, you know, some of the major issues between that lot and this lot are some of the issues involving water and, and the change in elevation. And that's something you really need some professional engineering uh, to look at that, that it's more than just a cursory, you know, wouldn't it be pretty if this thing was here? I, you know, one of the questions, comment to respond to, Jack, is that I, I somehow feel that I can't make the decision about the lot next door till I see somebody who has an idea. I don't, we may never do it, we, but, but I don't want to just sell that coal without knowing there's an idea that I can have a piece of grass next to this building at least. Or to sell it, it never comes back. That's right. So I, I mean, I just, all together, if I could see some professional ideas as to how we might enhance the front, whether it's this year, next year, or another year, before I make the decision on that lot. And also, there are other pieces of land that we need to consider around the building. And so I just can't do it in a vacuum. That's, that's sort of why I'd like to get some part of it moving forward. Councilor Watson. Uh, Madam Chair, I, um, you know, I had exa the exact same thoughts as Councilor McGinty about this project coming forward at this time. Uh, I have, um, but I also have the same concerns that you have about how do we decide what to do with the lot. Because it's not, you know, new news to anybody here that I have thought that I agree with Jack that looking at selling a portion of that lot at some point might benefit us. But whether we sell all of it or a portion, I think it's hard to, as you've just described, to decide that because we don't know what we may need for this building. So I wouldn't be supportive of, of a sale at, at this juncture. But um, I can in good faith tell you that I will support moving forward with this project financially until I know where we totally come out on the municipal budget and my fears about the school budget. And I just think that we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit. I'd be more comfortable uh, tabling this and looking at this as we go through the budget process, knowing that this is something we want to look at as we go through budget deliberations, trying to, to see if there's a money so that we have, if we get six firms out there, that we feel comfortable that they, they're not just spinning their wheels, that at some point in the near future there'll be money to do something potentially for the project. And I can't support that tonight because I have, as I said, some real reservations about the impact of the school budget, which, which we have yet to see in our hands yet. So um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, my concern is that it's, it's uh, a little too soon to make the decision about whether we can fund this. And I'd like to see it tabled until we get uh, farther into the budget process and know what we're looking at and whether or not we actually will have some money to even go forward in a study. And I say that also in light of we have a very aggressive, financially aggressive plan for playgrounds. There's being put landscaping of playgrounds that's being put before us. And we've made a commitment of how much money we will spend, but still, and we have other landscaping needs in this town as well. So I would love to have support this study, but I, I cannot do it tonight, sitting where I sit tonight. Let, let me see if I can get this straight from the manager. We're sending out a request for proposal to six landscape architectural firms who have the option of saying, I'm not interested in that. I don't even want to draw our design. I have an intern that might be interested in that. At that point, I know that, I mean, I put contracts out to contractors all the time. It costs them money to do their bids, but they come to me. Is there, we're going to put this request for proposal out six, to six people. Four may respond, three may respond, two, one, some may respond. At that point, there's no funding. They're going to come back and say, hey, this is an idea, here's a sketch, this is what we're talking about. But we haven't yet exchanged any dollars yet. We're just asking to see if they're going to respond. Are they going to come up with a plan to give us some ideas? Do they want to sit and talk with us once around with this little committee without the co any cost, any real cost attached to it? I mean, I don't pay these contractors to bid when I send out my RFPs. They have to do a lot of work to come up with their costs, and they come up with them. I'm unclear a little bit on this process myself, and I want to make sure. I mean, I, I understand what I, you're all saying, but I don't see where the money is yet. Yeah. Well, That's I'm just what I referring want. to what yeah. Michael said, and, he, and if we're not going to fund it, maybe we shouldn't go forward. What maybe I can clarify, what you're asking them to do is to submit proposals, in essence, to develop a master plan for the property. Uh, we would find out the, 
from them through their answer to the request for the proposal how much they would charge us to develop that master plan. Uh, at that point, we'd know what it is we were looking for cost. We would know, you know, can we fund it from some existing program? Or even, or even perhaps, is there someone in the community who wants to donate this master plan to the town in terms of, you know, paying for it? That, that's also a possibility that, you know, someone doesn't like the ugliness of the pavement over there and would like to help fund the master plan. I don't know. Uh, but then, you know, the council will know then the cost. You can decide to use municipal funds or not. Uh, so no money. We will say all six respond. Yeah. We will get six proposals. proposals back that outline that they would give us X, Y, and Z type of a plan or, or whatever based upon our description of work and that they would charge us where from a dollar to a bazillion dollars mm -hmm for developing a plan. Yeah. And I presume if it came back that they, all six of them said it would cost a bazillion dollars, we'd all say, well, say no. great, but that's wonderful and goodbye. Um, and if it all came back, it would cost one dollar, we'd probably all say, hey, nifty, go ahead. It's obviously going to be somewhere in between, but there's no money. <laughs> the town's not going to pay for anything to that point. We get the proposals back and the town pays but the, nothing to that just, point. On the timing, too, this is due to come back in April 18th. We would review them, meet with the groups between April and May. This would come back to the council at your May council meeting at, on the same evening that you'll be uh, reviewing and approving the budgets. So you'll know then whether or not this fits into the overall financial plan of the community in terms of having the master plan work. But I'm not sure I, my question was, was answered. Was I correct that we would not have spent, when we get these six proposals back, we would know not have spent a dollar right. at that point. Is that but correct? But we would know how much we need. But we would know how much it might cost us mm -hmm. to develop a plan. Yes, That's right. Tom would not have spent it. nothing right. to, to find to out proposal. what it's going to cost us to move forward, and then you can decide whether to do it. Councilor McGinty. But, but Mike alluded to the danger of that is that if, if we don't have the, the end amount of money to to develop a plan. You know, why are we asking for a plan if we, if we can't fund the plan, that we can't make, make out the plan, we can't build out the plan? But the, the plan might include, as, as Councillor uh, Watson alluded to, selling some of the property. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Just, we, we're in the blind. We just don't know anything now. From my, my mind, there's no doubt, if it's not going to cost us anything, there's no downside in asking them. To well, for, for, the, for, the, for the RP originally, yes, but then, the th then we're going to have to spend money for them to develop the plan. Of course, but, yeah. but there is But if we, can't, we don't have any money to fund the plan, why are we asking them to develop a plan that we can't fund? But we don't know we don't. yet how much the plan is going to be. I see no downside to asking them for proposals. If they, if they all say a million dollars, then we say, see you later. But if they say something cheap, I have no idea how much this stuff costs to do. But if they say something really cheap, we might decide that it might be worth X amount of money to us to find out whether we can sell the property next door. That's a decision we would have to make then. But I can't make decisions without information. And if the information costs us nothing to get, I see no downside to getting the information. I think Maybe also there's no. Well, there's one other one other part of it that I see as a possibility. I'm not just talking about the front of the building and the side of the building. We have a, a piece of land here. When we first used to do zoning, we used to say, what does two and a half acres look like? Well, this is two and a half acres out to the fence. But we also have the community center building that we're going to decide on. We have a very quick decision to decide because of the, the renovation of the millwork building. So we're talking about whether to sell the community center. Do we need the driveway? Do we keep the driveway, sell the building? That, to me, is all part of the thing. And is, that, is there some information for whatever the cost is we don't know? that would be valuable to making that decision in the fall for there, as well as the decision for next door. So I, I tend to agree with Councilor swift Kayata that if it's $1,000, we may be able to fund it. If it's $20,000, we're not going to fund it. It's clearly, we're not going to fund it. But if there's some way that we can find out some information that'll help us make a decision on community center building, on the driveway to the community center building, on the lot next door, I don't want to sell any of those things in the blind without having some idea of what it will take to put a whole plan together. Councillor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, 
When you put on an RFP, there obviously is a reasonable expectation on the part of the people that are responding that, that are putting their time and money into this to, to submit that, that we're going to go forward with a project. And I would like to see somehow maybe get an estimate from somebody then of what would be a reasonable ballpark figure what we'd be talking before without these actual RFPs going out and then putting a huge amount of time into it to, to come back to us on that. So that we would know, okay, yes, it's going to cost $50,000 to do this. Is that something we could live with? And again, a ballpark figure. Right now, we haven't got a clue what it's going to cost for this here. And we're asking people to take their time and money to give us a plan that we'd then buy and pay more additional for. Yeah, they can, say, they can no. say no, and they're going to tell us what the cost of the plan is. It's like working with the federal or the state government, right? You make a proposal, they vote on it. They're not going to vote on it until they know what it's going to cost. Well, we can't vote on the final thing until we know what it's going to cost. So I just wanted to see if there's somebody out there that will do it. It's is a municipality. It's either funded or it's not funded. When they come to us, we say, ha, we can't fund this. Uh, they may have an expectation, and it may be this year, next month, six months, three years. I just wanted to see who's out there, what could happen, and what it would cost to find out what the total lot plan will be for all the lots involved. Councilor Fritz. I, I just want to say that it, I don't think what we're asking in the RFP is for them to go through a whole big process of designing a plan and a proposal. We're asking them for background on their firm, what, what, their, what their personnel is, what their contact person is, lists of their other clients that they've had that we could contact, their, rele their relevant experience, their fee schedules. Those are things I think they have pretty well put in a yes. package already, and, and that's not a huge deal. So that we can then evaluate how much they're going to charge to do the design. That's the next step. We may be able to phase it in once you know, too. Yeah, this, this particular phase is, is really just the schematic phase. If you look at that, it's listed as phase one. It, it's not design engineering. Uh, it's, it's a master plan for landscaping and site improvements. It's, it's not the full design engineering. Design engineering, development of plans, the final plans, bid specs, contract specs, none of that is included in this. So, you know, we, we are looking here, my guess, I, I, you know, it's on pretty close on, on either side of 5,000 is probably the, the dollar amount that we're looking at. For the next phase? For this phase. I thought you said there'd be no. We're talking about mailing the letters out to the. That, that's $15. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, if we were, the, the proposals are going to come back, the, the three, four, or five, or six proposals. And my sense is, is they're going to say, yes, we'll do this work, and yes, it'll be between four and $6,000. Oh, we still haven't spent it till after we get it back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, we'll come back to the council after we've said, you know, if you want to do this, this is the best firm to do it, and this is how much they'll do it for. Okay. And, and just to add one point, I, I'm in no way saying we should uh, be t telling these people in our request for proposal that, yes, we're going to do this project. I don't mean to fool sure. anybody that we're going to be doing this project for sure. I, I have no problem with the manager or whoever saying, we're just trying to find out if we want to do this project. It's not a sure thing that we're going to do something. Just a, a reminder to the council, we had a uh, library parking lot designed, I think, four years ago. Uh, and we, it's still a vacant lot. And, but yet, if we ever do it, we know how we're going to do it. <laughs> well, Council McGinty. I just, I mean, we're facing a tax increase. It's going to be probably with the schools, if the, the way the, the funding's going for the school, the state subsidy for the schools going, it's going to be a, a big tax increase on the school side. Uh, my, well, what some might consider a minor increase on the municipal side. Um, I mean, I just can't support spending any money until we get through this budget. Um, and I think that we kind of set ourselves up for failure. We're going to say we're going to spend $5,000 to develop, develop a master plan that we're not going to be able to implement. But that's, as I understand it, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm perhaps I'm getting more confused rather than less, but that's not the decision at hand. No. The decision at hand is to ask them how but, much they would charge. Okay, well, I'm t I guess I'm telling you that I won't support spending the money, so there's no sense for me to support sending out the RFP. That's what I'm saying. So you wouldn't, if, if they could do 
theoretically, if they could do a plan, a detailed plan for five dollars, you wouldn't support spending the money. Oh, I'd spend the five dollars. Sure. <laughs> but that's not going. But we know that. We know that's not going to happen. No, we know that's yeah. not realistic. Sick. But there's something between five dollars and you know ten thousand dollars that is your change point, and there's something that's everybody's change point here. You know, I might. I, I'm with you on let's not spend money. Believe me, I, I don't want to be the the finance chair that goes down in history as being the, the biggest wastrel in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I really want to make sure that we do a good job for the citizens and provide a very lean budget. But I don't think that what we decide right now is going to cost the citizens a buck. So. Uh, and you're going to move into the next budget, you know, well, but, the but next was, budget thing. So you're going to be nice to have the figure. Can I suggest this? What, can we refer this to the Finance Committee? And let's look at it in the context of the next budget and say, Okay, we can identify the five thousand dollars. Right. And we, in in if we know in the con well, if we can take a but we won't know. We won't know unless we vote to send out the RFPs. Yeah, how to put it into the next budget? But it is in that range, Manny. It's, it's yeah. Okay. So so call it five. For maybe the two thousand and I mean you know the next budget. Well, I don't see any downside. It's not going to cost us a buck. We're not going to pull well, I, I think there's. I think there's a professional. I think the professional downside, from my perspective, is to ask six firms to do some work, where I know that I won't support spending any additional money for them to do the work. As, as Councillor Fritz said, I think the, the information we're, re we're requesting is pretty much resumes of personnel, lists of clients, relevant experience. It's stuff they already have on a disk. Whatever, we can beat this one to death all night. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to refer it to the Finance Committee. Uh, Second. <laughs> I, I guess I just did I'm willing to put the $15 up also to send the mail out to these people. Madam Chair, can I make a motion that we refer this to the Finance Committee? Certainly can. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Yeah. Councilor Swift. Just a point of clarification. Yes. If we send it to the Finance Committee, doesn't that mean we're not going to send this out now, which would mean we wouldn't have the information that the Finance Committee would need to make a decision? That's true. Could I make a comment about that, please? Councilor <laughs> Watson. But the, where I see it is the information that we're going to get back, as you just described, isn't going to help us make that decision anyway. Seeing their resumes and seeing what other projects isn't going to help us make a decision. I mean, we've got to spend another $5,000 to get what we need to make a decision. I mean, I may be missing something here, granted. I mean, it's getting late, and I, I may be getting as confused uh, or more than Councillor swift but I, I, It's hard to say. I, it's hard to say. <laughs> but my feeling is that the information, if, if it is we're asking resumes and projects, isn't going to help us make that decision. And my other, my, the other point that I'd like to make is that just, you know, it's a, it's a trite phrase, but, you know, perception is reality. And I, the townspeople's perception of our spending more money right now on more landscaping projects, when we're looking at playground projects, when we're looking at, you know, the, the building for the police department is going to be wonderful. But when this building comes down, there are, as you said, Mike, I'll quote you, there are going to be some eyebrows raised, because that's going to happen about the same time they get their tax increases. Uh, and they're going to see it, you know, we're holding the line. I, I applaud you for your efforts with the municipal budget. And I know the school department is working very hard, too, but there are things beyond their control. And I just think that if we send the message that we're taking on another project um, of capital improvement, so to speak, but it doesn't have to do with actual buildings, but um, improvement to the infrastructure of the town, I think that we're kind of sending a mixed message that we're working really hard to save your tax dollars, and yet we're spending it on the other side. All that said, I understand that we could use this study to help us make some decisions. I would like to see us deliberate this, not here tonight, but I second it going to the Finance Committee because I think it's worthy of more discussion, even if we turn around and bring it back next month. That's my feeling. If, could I 
That's, you know, I, I can certainly agree to that since I'm the one that sort of put this out here. Even though the timing, I, I understand the timing, but I, I simply will not make a decision on the community center or on the lot next door until I have some idea what we're talking about. So whenever those items come up, I can't make, I can't make them in isolation from this building. So if you want those things to go forward, then... I just have to have some idea of what's going to happen. Can, can, Councillor swift Kayata had something. No, I, I just wanted to say that I think, I don't mean to be sounding like I'm reversing myself, because I'm not, but Councillor Watson makes some, some good comments about the perception could be that we are trying to spend money. Um, and if we do end up referring this to, to the Finance Committee, I think we should discuss it, but I think we should try and get it back at the next meeting, at the next regular town council meeting. After we've had a chance to discuss it as a After finance committee, discuss it whatever meaning that is. Okay, Councillor Watson, did you have something else? I did, and it's, it's totally evaporated in my brain, and I, it was a great point, I thought, but <laughs> I didn't write it down, so it's gone. Excuse me. Um, sorry. It'll come to me later. There's a motion on the floor. It's been moved and seconded to send this item to the finance committee. I don't know that we have any dates except that you... Right. Uh, how, or, um, however, I it, must express my concern that we don't devote that whole meeting no. <laughs> to talking about this project because we have plenty of regular finance committee meeting uh, budget stuff to do. So I, I just want to caution us that it does need more discussion, but let's try to limit ourselves or else we'll be here all, all night. But we'll be in a workshop mode. It'll be in a workshop mode, but it is open to the public, too, so sure. if the public wants to chime in, they can come along. Come on down. Is there any further discussion of the motion? She got her point. point. My remember? senior moment passed me, and I do remember what I was going to say. I have asked um, Manager McGovern if he would put together for me um, and for the rest of the Finance co uh, Committee a look at our capital projects and where we are and where we are in terms of what we budgeted and what we've spent and whether or not there may be some money. I just requested that this morning. There may be some money there that's already been set aside that we could easily see that maybe could fund something here. Um, so that's information that will help us, I think, make a decision if there's already something somewhere in the budget. I'm sure, Michael, that you've squeezed it about as hard as you can. I don't think there'll be much this year. <laughs> but, uh, that was we can my hope. thought. We can hope. That yeah. would be lovely. Oh. All right, there's a motion on the floor. No further discussion. All those in favor? I'm sorry, could oh, we repeat what is, the motion is? I'm, the motion is motion to send this item for discussion while the council sits as a finance committee. Okay. Moved and Thank seconded. You. All those in favor? I don't really care. It was unanimous. It was, <laughs> it was tense. I mean, <laughs> sort of like I didn't want to stand alone to lose it, so I decided to join the crew. Yeah. Item number 82, um, request to approve a poll location on Spurwink Avenue near the <laughs> Paputic Club. I understand the poll is not up there yet, so we don't need to ask. I hope this was a, one doesn't have to go to the Finance Committee, too. What was that? I said, I hope this one doesn't have to go to the Finance Committee, too. <laughs> just, I checked the poll's not there yet. Yeah. Just as I might as an aside while we're discussing this, uh, we, we also have some polls pending going in Cooper Drive. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware, but since November, the Public Works garage has not had any, the new garage since it moved there, they did not have email access, nor have they had any cable TV access, which, which is crucially important in the Public Works because of, that's the way you get weather information now. So, you know, I may, unless the council tells me, Michael, don't you dare do that. Uh, if there's some poll locations that come up that will enable that to get done on our property uh, between now and the next council meeting, I might move that along, assuming that you will approve these things unanimously anyway, just to, to keep it moving, uh, because uh, we really do need, we've been having an awful time trying to get that done. Madam Chair, a question on that. While they had the big trenches wide open, why weren't the cables buried, rather than sticking all kinds of poles all over that property? Uh, just cost, because if you put the, all of those different wires, you know, we had an estimate here from, to put this, it was over a million dollars in terms of what you need to do underground with, with the separation 
with those tubing systems of all the underground wire. So it, it's mainly a cost issue. Okay. We've, we're, we're putting some of it underground here through, through uh, conduit, but it's a, it's a cost issue. Even though we had the trenches wide open yep. up there? All right. Because they, re they require separation. <laughs> so I, so if, if, if Verizon says, can we put them up, and your council meeting hasn't happened yet, you know, the council always used to ask the question always, are these poles up yet? <laughs> I might answer yes on Next those. <laughs> Is there a motion yet? There's a motion made, just uh, not seconded yet. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the location on Spurwick Avenue of the new poll. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, none. I'd like to take a vote to take an item up out of order. Item number 83, which is um, uh, the abatement issue. Did you see that document on your, on your table here when you came? Madam Chair, I move that we take item, item number 83 uh, out of order. Second. Second. Or add it to the agenda. It's been moved and seconded. We take item number 83. We in reference to a, an abatement issue for the homestead exemption on a piece of property in Cape Elizabeth. We'll talk about it as soon as we get the item. All those in favor? Yep. Right there in your hand. It's actually a motion to suspend the rules. Yeah, we're just, um, yeah, we're not voting on this yet. We're just voting, right. Take an item up out of, suspend the rule, take an item up out of order. The motion is to suspend the rules, and I seconded the motion. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor? Opposed, none. A motion to take up item number 83. So moved. So moved. Second that. It's been moved and seconded to take up an item out of order, item number 83. All those in favor? So unanimous. All right. You have on your desk a document called an inter-office inter memorandum. Do you see that? Michael, you want to take this? Yeah, this is it's clear. Of Peter Riley at 13 Juniper Lane. We don't know why, but two years ago, the homestead exemption was removed from this property, a uh, record in error. Uh, the assessor is, is permitted to make an, an abatement of the current year, but it requires action of municipal offices to go back uh, for any year up to three years beyond the first year. This only happened an additional year, so our very able new assessor, who's doing a great job, is recommending to the council that you consider granting the abatement for the second year. Uh, which was the last year uh, in the amount of $139.02. So moved. <laughs> I've seconded that. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Fair is fair. Yes. yes. Opposed, none. Motion carries. Is there any items not on the agenda for citizen discussion? Hearing this, none at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Whoops. Just to have one uh, comment, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanks Patrick's Day on Saturday, and Michael, both a happy Thanks Patrick Day and a happy birthday. Oh, that's true. Oh. <laughs> Our Irishman here. <laughs> Mediterranean Irish? No, he's the Irishman. <laughs> Greeks don't have a special day. <laughs> <laughs> Just every day. <laughs> every day is a special day, that's right. Uh, all those in favor, the motion was for adjournment. It is unanimous. Thank you very much.